Happy to be here with my very special guest this week, actor and chocolatier, Tom Gallup. <laughs> Tom, how are you? Oh, Derek, I'm great, man. Thank you so much for, for having me on. Fantastic. And I can say that you are the first chocolatier out of, this will be episode 389 of the podcast. Oh, God. Hope so, man. I mean, it's the actor slash chocolatier that you Yeah, have exactly. Yes. Yeah, right? So th this is a... The, actors. There are yeah. thousands of chocolatiers, but when you have a hybrid, now that's something special. Oh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, for those that are watching the YouTube version, you can see that you're actually in your shop. And I'm really excited to to talk about, you know, your your business venture in doing that in a little bit. Yeah. But um, I, I did want to ask you to to kind of kick things off, because for the most part, you know, I talk with um, actors, directors, you know, those that work in film and TV. So right. what was it that made you want to get into acting in the first place? So uh, I think I just gravitated towards it uh, at an early age. I mean, I was not, I, I enjoyed sports, but I don't know that I necessarily excelled. And I, uh, I had kind of a, a gift of being a songbird. I don't, you know, I, I remember um, I, I sang the national anthem at my, uh, my lane picnic when I was four. Um, it, it didn't end well, but it was a lot of fun while it was happening. Um, and you know, my mother, I, I was one of four kids, my older brother and sister, um, do gooders and, you know, did beautifully in school and very respectful. And I feel like at the time, baby youngest child had to make my mark. And I was a cut up, you know, I was the class clown. I, I, uh, and I feel like, uh, I mean, our parents loved us unconditionally, but that was me standing out is just kind of, I was a performing monkey and I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I loved it. But, um, you know, started singing, I think in sixth grade, I was the candy man, ironically, in my sixth grade production. Um, and then from there, I just, I really, I think I went into voice lessons when I was in seventh and eighth grade, started doing productions in high school and just had the bug and uh, was really probably at my happiest when I was on stage. When you mentioned being, uh, you know, like the class clown and whatnot, did you find that, you know, acting and doing these things, did they become like an outlet for you? Um, oh, look at that. See, everybody wants chocolate, Derek. It doesn't matter the time. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. No worries. Beverly Hills Toy Show. Hi, it's Tom. Hi, Ida. You know what? I'm in the middle of a podcast. Um, can we talk tomorrow? We're going to be open tomorrow at 11. Yes, my dear. Thank you, my dear. Okay. Bye-bye. See, it's, I'm always on, man. It doesn't matter. It's after five. We're closed. I will answer every call because it was a chocolate emergency. you got to be able to answer that call. Sorry. Hey, as, a, as a business owner, you got to hustle. You got to hustle, man. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry. You were asking me about the class clown and that I did. Yeah. So, did, when you... You mentioned being, you know, like a class clown and a cut up and whatnot. Did you find that right. once you started acting, did that become like an outlet for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think some people gravitate towards it. There are a lot of actors that are very um, introverted, right? Just not the case with me. I am out there, you know, I mean, in the shop, I literally i am a performing monkey. I mean, I just... It's like when you come into the shop, it's dinner and a show. That's what my wife always says. It's like you get a dinner and a show. And and I I kind of pride myself on um, being able to turn it on. It's not always on, but but I think depending on the role that's, you know, that's in front of you, can you turn it on? No matter what happened in the day, can you turn it on? Show must go on. And so um, I think I had a knack to make people laugh, and that fed me. And... And I think probably growing up, maybe I recognize that's what made me happiest. That's what I did best. Let's follow that path. And um, it got me to, you know, owning a chocolate shop. Clearly it was, you know, maybe the path wrong, wrong path taken, but I'm being facetious. It's, it's all good. Hey, it's the cool thing about life is you never really know where it's going to take you. You know, I, I have oh this conversation too, is like, yeah, you might have a goal to do something completely different. But there's oh. that one little route that you take where it's just it changes everything. 
It could be just doors. one little moment. Sliding doors. And that's, yep. It's uh, funny you mention that because um, uh, I'm, I'm actually about to launch a couple podcasts myself. Okay. Um, one is with my wife. It's going to be called For Love and Chocolate. And it's really going to be uh, a relationship oriented podcast where we we talk about our life our love um our ups and downs and then we also uh, will kind of have a dear abby segment where we're answering emails and letters and ultimately we bring on uh, a couple that's been together for years and years and really dig into that seminal moment that they met what was the connection what keeps it going what keeps it fresh um how does chocolate fit in to your lives and your love the other one um, is with uh, one of my best buddies, who also actor, he's a director and a writer and producer also. We all um, kind of came up together, right? And the title of this podcast is going to be, I'm Not Famous, But My Friends Are. And it's just bringing on our A-list buddies who have made it and who are at the, you know, the top 1% of the 1%. And it's all about sliding doors. It's like, hey, man. I'm at least as talented as you. What the fuck happened? How? Why are you getting this box office bonanza? And why am I fill in the blank? And and there's so many of us out there that are journeyman actors where you meet them or you see them and you're like, oh my god, you're the guy from. You couldn't place me. You don't actually have a name. Um, and it really, honestly, I, I feel like so many actors that are making a living but never really got to that next echelon. They, uh, it's a sliding door situation. There is that one role that just didn't happen. I mean, how many actors almost were on Friends? How many actors almost, you know, did the next great sitcom? And, and that really is the difference. That one audition is the difference between, you know, having that second home in Malibu and, uh, you know, the guy that's just trying to make it every day. So it's fascinating. Your sliding doors uh, analogy is... <clears throat> It's really ripe for discussion, and, and it's uh, it is uh, confounding sometimes when you think about, oh my God, that was just so close. And and conversely, it's like I I got that job because I was in this place at this time. Yeah, and but yeah. I, I mean, we're here now, right? We are where we are now. Yep, exactly. And I I love both those ideas for the podcast because you know there's there are so many podcasts that are out there now that it's tough to really do something that's kind of unique or different yeah. and that's where i yeah. think your idea of you know, bringing actor director friends on and just talk with them i think is a great concept because you have those connections and you have the experience of being in that world and well, I, also I, do oh go ahead i know i was just gonna say i think that um you know the a lot of times these, these actors go on these talk shows and their, their wings are kind of clipped. You know, they, they don't want to give up too much. Maybe, maybe they're easy, maybe they're comfortable, maybe they're not. But when you're talking with a lifelong friend and, you know, you ask the serious questions and you want serious answers, you know, you can take the piss out of each other. But at the end of the day, they're going to connect with you and they're going to be straight with you. And then they're going to say, if you actually release this podcast, I'm going to shoot you in the face. So, you know, I'm sure. No one will ever sign a release, but it'll be fun while we're doing it. Yeah, exactly. And also the one with your wife, you know, I, that's also can be a great bonding thing because, you know, like a, about a year ago, my wife became a, um, a wedding planner and coordinator and wow. I've been, you know, helping her out with that. And I've been doing um, like wedding videography for years. Oh, so fantastic. we've been, you know, teaming up on that yeah. and we've talked about doing like a, a wedding planning podcast together or have like, uh, you know, florists or, you know, cake bakers or caterers and talk about right. the, the business because, you know, we've been in that world enough now that we kind of understand it. And it's a bonding experience for us. I'm going to flip, I'm going to flip the script here, Derek. How long have you been married? Uh, this April will be two years. Okay. So, so my wife and I just celebrated three years. Oh, wow. Right? Congratulations. Been- Thank you. Likewise. And we're coming on nine. And um, I really think, and it's, it's taken me, you know, a lifetime of experience to understand this, but the couples, the married couples, it, they don't even have to be married, but the couples that actually work together and still love each other and want to be together, that's a rare thing, man. Because 
half the guys I know are like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get out of the fucking house. Just give me space. I need my boys. I need, right? I'm so happy to go to work and come home and I get dinner and I watch my piano. And, we go. and obviously those marriages are kind of dead or they're just, they're stagnant. But when I tell you that my wife and I just love being together, love being around each other. We actually recently did a crazy thing and I was, I was, I went kicking and screaming because I thought, God, you really don't know me at all if you really want to do this. But we went out and we bought an Airstream and we now, uh, at least two or three weekends a month hit the road. We hit the road and we go to somewhere else in the central coast. And that's a lot of togetherness, man. It's us and our three dogs and, we just love being together and we love sharing ideas and we love to make each other laugh. And that's the podcast is about capturing those moments, those couples that experience in that. What is the connective tissue? What keeps it fresh? What keeps it going? I'm, I'm excited about both. of them. They're going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you get that level of realness that you don't get if you're watching like a, like a major talk show, not to say that none of the moments there are authentic, but when you get a podcast, you can control what you do, what you talk about. And, you know, that's what people really are drawn to are those real life stories and experiences. Well, I mean, case in point, you know, I met you three minutes ago, right? Had no idea what we were going to talk about. But the fact that it's this free form, we never know if it's going to zig or it's going to zag. That's, you know, that's just kind of life. That's what's what else can we find out that's interesting? about each other you know what what was the path that you took and why i mean all these things are, are great questions and if it's scripted it's like oh you know make sure that you talk about the story where you you know you got bullied by your teacher i don't know i mean there's so many examples of what's just not really raw and interesting and anyway yeah no exactly uh you mentioned three dogs what kind of dogs do you have <laughs> you really don't want to go down this rabbit hole man i'm telling you right <laughs> This is a bad day to my dogs, but we will. Um, I've got long-haired mini dachshunds. Okay, okay? sweet. And, you know, badger hunters. I'm, and the minis are really rabbit hunters. Uh, so cute. Oh, my God. I've got one that's a dorky, a dachshund Yorkie mix, right? She's 15. She's the elder statesman of the group. The others, Winifred and Phineas, Winnie and Finney, are just the cutest little assholes you've ever met. They are ch pissing, shitting machines. And uh, did I think at this age that I'd be diapering my dogs? No, but that's where we are. And it's embarrassing and it's humiliating. And I try not to have them in the diapers when they leave the house. But for the moment, that's where we are because I cannot step in another puddle of piss in my home. Yeah, I just can't. Man, I can't do it. It's painful in my wiring. You, honestly, you can just, there can be complete silence. In the middle of the night, you go, God, son of a bitch, again. Have it again. God damn it. God, which one of you pissed all over my rug? It's, so I love these dogs with all my heart and they travel with us. I get it. I know I need to get a trainer and we're going to do that. We're going to do that. But for the moment, oh, they're just the bane of my existence. In the best, most love. Exactly. Like, despite how frustrating they can be, you still love them. Yeah, but they're yappy little bastards, aren't they? <laughs> uh, I find that the smaller dogs, they, they have like, the largest personalities. And I don't know oh if it's because of a size thing. So they have to be, you know, like try to be the alphas, but they kind of do. They, they do. They've got big dog. I mean, these dogs are 10 pounds. They're tiny, but they're long. I mean, they're long and, um, and they're very sweet, but oh, I just got to get a handle on it. I just, <laughs> I mentioned it to a couple friends. I mentioned just in passing, it's like, oh, yeah, my dogs are great. I mean, they're in diapers. And they're like, what? You put diapers on your dog, man? And they're not 15? What is wrong with you? So I get a little shaming. And I have to step outside and say, yeah, you know what? This is probably not normal. It's not normal. Not normal to have dogs that you have to diaper. So I got to get a handle on it. I get it. And I will. I promise. Please let your listening audience know I will take care. I'm excited to, to hear some updates on your on your oh dogs. My God. <laughs> oh, can I tell a little anecdote. Can I share? Sure. A morning sure. Anecdote? Yeah. <sighs> okay. So <laughs> the, the dogs sleep with us. They're right. in bed with us. And we had to get an extra big bed. 
so that we could fit all the dogs. And they're in the diapers, but I mean, honest to God, it's like at least every half hour, it just smells like somebody shit the I just, it's bad all the, right? And I got it in the middle of the night last night, and I was like, God damn it, another one. And so I'm literally taking each one to the bathroom to do a, a poop check. I had to do a check. Winifred, my sweet little girl, she was clean as a whistle, all good. Got her dressed up. Phineas thought he might be the culprit. Looked at the diaper, all good. Went to re-diaper him, swung him onto my lap. Something flew up in the air, and bam, if a giant shit didn't fly down onto the ground. It was stuck to his ass, and I had flying shit all around me in the middle of the night. And so my wife and daughter here, God damn it, what now? That's... You see, I'm, I'm getting all worked up, Derek. All worked up. I'll, I'll take the heat for that. Thank you, man. <laughs> you you dragged it out of me. There, there's, there's a funny idea for a, a skit or a short film in there somewhere. God, I mean, uh, I can't, it's like PTSD. If I see another dog shit in a diaper, I don't know, man. I don't know if I can make it through the day. <laughs> but enough um, about me. Yeah. Enough about like yeah. Crazy yeah. So uh, to, to kind of transition back into your acting <laughs> career, we'll go. See, this is what I love about doing the podcast is just we bounce from one topic to another. Yeah. So, yeah. So you decide that you're going to give the acting thing a go. Yeah. How do you get your foot in the door of of the film and TV industry? So I was I was fortunate enough. I went to um, undergrad at Michigan national champion. I was about Wolverine. to say congratulations on that. Oh, Thank you. Uh, took my son to the Rose Bowl. So much fun. Anyway, oh, wow. That's I'm, awesome. Diehard big blue fan. Oh my God. I get chills anyway. Uh, and studied theater and communications and then went, uh, got my graduate degree at uh, NYU at Tisch, got my master's there. So I studied, um, conservatory training for three years there. And the beauty about that is not only do you get the training, but the end of the three years, you do um, you do these essentially these auditions along with the Yale School School of Drama and Juilliard, so all of the biggest cast and directors uh, and agents from New York and LA come to watch the showcase. Uh, and out of that, I got a great agent. Um, it's not like that for everyone. I mean, truly, there's a lot of pavement pounding that has to be done. So, so in that way, it was I was really fortunate. I mean, I, I put my time in. I mean, it's three years. It's it's not easy work. It's gratifying. Um, and so I feel like I kind of had a leg up because, boom, I've got an agent in New York and L.A. just right out of the gate. Um, and then it's just pound the pavement. I mean, no one's going to give you a job. you got to go out and get it. And so... Um, in New York, I did a little theater. I was really mostly a real estate agent, just trying to, you know, basically piece enough together so I could continue the dream. And then went out to L.A. in 92 um, and booked my first gig in, like, August. So it was eight months, which is not that long. In the, in the moment, you feel like it's a forever amount of time. Um, but got my first gig and then I got my second gig and my SAG card. And then just the work just kept happening. I, you know, the same cast directors would call me back and, and the agents were really great about, you know, playing on a gig that might be coming up. And so it really felt like from that point on 92 until man, I don't know, 98, 2000, I just, it was constant work for me. I was really fortunate. Um, a lot of recurring roles. I had a series regular role on a show that was, that lasted for a year. Um, and you know, that's honestly actors, what they need is a job. An actor gets a job and all of a sudden he's got the confidence and the confidence can be read in the room on a tape, wherever you go. You're just kind of, you're flying high. You're just, there's a, there's a confidence that, that kind of tends to fade away when you're not working or when you're not booking and when you're struggling. And, um, <clears throat> so that was just kind of my path was, was continuing to work and, and, uh, you know, saying yes, every chance I, I could get. And, uh, yeah, so it was a great ride. When you mentioned having constant work, you know, I was looking at your IMDb, IMDb page and yeah. you were on a lot of 
notable shows because like i i grew up in the 90s so i recognize a lot of the shows like home improvement um sister sister party of five mad about you seinfeld you were on all of these shows so did you have any idea that you know a lot of those shows like people still talk about them you know like what 30 years later now yeah i i mean honestly i still get recognized for my seinfeld episode i look so much different but for whatever reason, people just, that's, that's the one that they gravitate that. And I think, you know, I did eight years on Will and Grace and that was a big juggernaut of a show. And so people might not immediately recognize me from that, but they're it's like, I know what, what have I seen you on? Blah, 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 and you get that, that whole thing going. But, um, yeah, I think that, um, Probably the Seinfeld. I think I did a Murphy Brown in 94 that I thought, okay, well, this is kind of part of the annals of television. You know when you're doing a show that's got, you know, legs or either it's established. I mean, Seinfeld, at the time that I did that, that was my favorite show on TV. So when you get to do your favorite show, it's something, and, and, and something I'll never forget is um, at the day of taping, uh, I had shot a couple of my scenes and I'm sitting back at the craft service table, you know, just grabbing a snack. And then all of a sudden I hear, very funny man, Mr. Gallup. It was Seinfeld. It was Jerry just kind of paying me praise. It was paying praise. It was like, what? Thank you, Mr. Seinfeld, for saying anything. It was really magnanimous of him. Um, But that, yeah, that was great. Um, Shooting the Bourne movies. There's something about being on a big budget movie that's just... uh, it's kind of second to none. I, I, the work itself was great and gratifying, but I don't know, man. You're, it's like, I, you know, I would, I would liken it to if you're like building a, you're, you're an architect or you're, you're a, a worker building a coliseum. So you know this is going to be something great. And to be a, even a small part of it is just really exciting. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I look fun. I still have a very close relationship with uh, the director, Paul Greengrass. I did two movies with him and um, talk about a salt of the earth guy. So brilliant. And so he's brilliant. He's humble. He's just so talented and, um, and just very human. And that's not always the case, you know, in Hollywood. They're not, they're not always, uh, you know, that, that made cut from that stone. So it's, it's nice when you can spend time with them. Right. And I, I was going to bring up the Bourne movies as well, because I still think that series doesn't get the credit that it deserves. I thought, Ooh. you know, like, a, a, I think it came out at the perfect time because yeah. we were wanting that next, like, big action or espionage type of thriller movie. Yeah. And and that's and then, you know, the Bourne the Bourne series came out um, since you've done both film and television, you've done, you know, mm-hmm. multiple series and you've done some, some big budget movies. Yeah. What are the biggest differences between working in film as opposed to TV? I mean, I would say that, that if you're doing a big budget film, chances are you're going to be on location, right? So I think for, for supremacy, I was in Berlin for three months now, of those three months, I might have six days off in the middle. It's like, okay, well, my family's back home. My kids are back home. I kind of would like to be back home, but I'm also working, and this is a thrilling thing, versus the, you know, whether it's a sitcom or an hour format where you get to come home every night. Huge difference. You can have a family life, you know? You get your weekends off. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. When I did... Uh, when I did Home Improvement, uh, Matt Williams, who's the creator, there was some kind of party after a show. And, you know, again, I only did two episodes, so um, who was I? I was, a, I was a guest star, and but he was also very, very genuine and, and uh, a wonderful guy. And I think he's from the Midwest. It would make sense. I mean, all the sensibilities of that show. But um, I don't even know what we were talking about, but... He said, if I could make my way, I would be second banana in a, in a hit sitcom because the show doesn't ride on you. Um, you get the, you get all the laughs, right? They write for you. 
you show up when you show up, but you get to go home and, and no one's hounding you and the paparazzi don't really give a shit about you. But you make the money and you get the boom check when it goes in syndication. And then you can spend your days, you know, golfing or opening up a chocolate shop, whatever you want to do. Um, I think I've probably got off point, but but just to say the differences are pretty extreme. Yeah, and it seems like TV can move at a bit of a faster pace, too, because you've got, you know, you've got to make air with, you know, the episode and you've got a certain number of episodes you got to do in a season. And that's, yeah. you know, in, in talking with with actors that have worked both, that seems to be like the commonality is that they say that it moves at a faster pace. But you, you do bring up a good point about, you know, if you work on a sitcom. Yeah, you get to be at home and you get to have weekends off. And when you have a family, it's it's way different than if you're, oh. you know, if you're single and you can just kind of do whatever you want. Yeah. And and I would say that the hour format more mirrors the uh, the film world just because you're single, you know, whether it's single camera, three cameras going um, very. The, the pace is faster. I mean, you know, when we shot Born, um, you know, maybe we would get a couple pages done a day just depends on the action that was happening but you know with with uh, the hour format if you're shooting over seven or eight days you're knocking out eight pages a day it's move 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 and you get it and you move and there's you know because guess what next tuesday we have a new script and a new director and a new line producer and it's all got to, it's all changing so we got to go into overtime we got to go to golden time whatever it is that's why the producers are always tapping their watches because they can only go so long and, you know, to go an hour into overtime when you've got a crew of a hundred, it gets pricey. And so, you know, time is of the essence in those, those shows. You bring up a good point though, about, you know, like different episodes of a show having like a different line producer or a different director. Would you have other crew members, like say the camera crew or, you know, the set designers, would those largely be the same? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my experience is that um, the differences come with the uh, the director. There might be a different... No, I mean, I'm thinking about it. The ADs, they usually are a constant. The directors, obviously the writers, you, you know, unless you're Aaron Sorkin, someone, a new writer is going to be writing every different, every, you know, next week's script. But, um, yeah, because the directors, they've got to prep, and then they've got to go into post right after they finish. So they can't be directing the next episode while they're, you know, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done in post. Does having say like the same set designers, the same AD, does that help with the transition to having a new director? Oh, I think so. I think, um, I mean, most recently I did a, a recurring role on a CBS show called all rise. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a handful of episodes. I played an assistant DA, uh, which was great. But listen, in the same way the cast is a constant, it's nice to have the same makeup and wardrobe and hair and ADs and PAs that are familiar with you. And yeah, that's nice. It really, that's when it becomes a family. If you're always constantly shifting, then you're wondering, well, I, I, I don't know who that is. They don't know that, you know, I need to have my tea at 84 degrees. Or my milk tea, God damn it. No. Um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, you also, um, that's why I'm, I'm kind of a morning person already, but you know, I never had problem getting up at four 30 in the morning to make a five 30 call. That was, that's kind of when I'm at my happiest. Cause it's like, Oh, I'm going to work. This is, this is what I love to do. Not that I don't love my chocolate shop. It's also, it's just very different, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of your chocolate shop, yeah. let's talk about that. So your, um, Talk your chocolate shop. Down. <laughs> uh, Beverly Hills toy share. What gave you the idea to open up a, a chocolate shop? Okay. So to be fair, um, toy share has been, it's a 90, 90 year old Swiss chocolate company and it's been in Beverly Hills for 43 years. It's a franchise model. The woman that <clears throat> owned the franchise all those years about, I don't know, 15 years ago, she decided she wanted to slow down, wanted to retire. Her adult sons took over. They ran the show for a few years. And then about <clears throat> six years ago, I was dating a woman. Her daughter worked at Toysher. 
And she came home one day and she said, we're known for our champagne troubles. I mean, with Dom Perignon, it's 80% of what we sell. It's, they're exquisite. Sorry, it was a champagne truffle plug. She came in, she came home, she said, hey guys, um, here's some champagne troubles the last you're ever going to see. They're closing towards her. And my girlfriend, whose daughter worked there, was just struck silent. And she was like, baby, this is terrible. This is a terrible day. I'm so upset. They can't close Toysher. I've been going there for 20 years. I took my daughters when they were toddlers. We can't let this happen. This is terrible. I said, I know it's awful. And then she paused and she said, you love me, don't you? I said, I do. <laughs> Will you buy me a chocolate shop? So I did. And then she married me. And oh, that's wow. How you, that's how you close the deal. Buy her a chocolate shop. Anyway, so we did it. We bought it. We reached out to Mr. Toysher. He didn't know they were closing across the street. He confirmed it. Sold me the franchise. We There was a, a women's shoe store across the street from the existing Toysher that was closing. I got the lease. We started getting architects to build out the permits. And we opened that son of a bitch in four months. And wow. it's been just a rocket ship ride ever since. So much fun. That's so an amazing my wife, story. My wife and I actually ride our bikes to our chocolate shop every day, which is kind of the dream, right? I was about to say that's that's a dream to be able to to bike or even walk to to where you oh, are. That's that, that's heaven. That and so uh, yeah, we just uh it was a leap of faith um, because the the brand is iconic. It had, it had a 40-year following in Beverly Hills already. So, you know, we really had to be complete idiots to muck it up. It was built in. It's like, just just continue doing. And, and actually, you know, add your own special sauce, whatever that is. Add your personal. But they're going to send us the chocolate. They're going to send us all of the, the, uh, the gift boxes, which are a huge part of this brand. And then we just have to kind of, we're facilitators. I joke about it, but I'm not a chocolatier. I'm a chocolate facilitator. I literally open boxes. Oh, look, box of chocolate. Here we go. Open and you buy the chocolate. And that's it. That's all I do. And so my other friends that own restaurants and they're actually cooking or building or making things, they're pretty upset with me that all I do is open. Like, do you understand how, I mean, it's like you're working half as hard as we are. And you're probably making twice the money. And, you know, I am jealous and I want to be in that business. It's like, well, you can't because I, it's my business and you can't have it. That's <laughs> but I, I will say, to be fair, you mentioned earlier about every day being almost like dinner and a show because you're, you know, like you flip a switch and you're on when people come in. So you, in a way, you are selling your product and you do that oh. through your personality. So there, there's something to be said about that. Yeah, I, I I will say that. So there are 14 toysters in the world, right? Um, you know, they're in San Francisco, they're in La Jolla, Chicago, Boston, Philly, Toronto, two in New York, Abu Dhabi, Riyadh. You know, there's one in, there was one in Munich and, and uh, they had one in Hong Kong. And Thailand. I mean, they were all over the world. None of them are actors. Not one single one is an actor. So I got that going for Yes, I do. And, and I, you know, I, I think that um, our whole motto is, you know, people are coming in already happy they're in a chocolate shop. Can I send them away just a little bit happier than they were? Just going to lift their day a little bit more. And I try to do that every time someone walks in. One well, with so much, you know, negativity out in the world now that it, it's it's great to have somebody be a positive influence. And it's like, yeah, you go in a chocolate shop. So you get chocolate, you're already happy, but why not just yeah. put that little cherry on top? Yeah. 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 There, <laughs> we, most of our customers are really happy, right? They're, they're, they're happy. People. But the last week it was after Christmas and we are just so spent in December. I mean, we work really long. I mean, I probably processed over 800 shipments. Forget the in-store. 800 packages went out. It's just a really Jesus crazy time. Yeah. And I, and for better or worse, I am the only one handling the shipping. So if, I, if I'm not feeling good, it's not getting out and it has to get out. 
it's chocolate for Christmas. I have to do it. But there was a guy that came in, and we just were not in the mood. He was just one of these wah, 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 wah. He was a real Charlie Brown, but I mean, worse. And he said something about, um, well, it's the end of the world. This, this year is going to be the end of the world. And I, you know, I stopped short of saying, get that out of my store. But we did ask him to maybe shh, find his chocolate elsewhere because the truffles don't need that energy around them. The truffles like positive energy. It's like a lake when you throw a rock, the ripples, you get that. The truffles don't want that energy. They're going to take it on and now you're going to eat the truffle. Now you're going to think it's the end of the world. We like positive energy around our truffles, Derek. As you should. I think that's what, not just the truffles, but I think everybody needs a little more positive energy. Yeah, man. And, and I'm, I'm proud to say that, um, we have a lot of customers that as they're leaving, they will say, thank you so much. You guys made my day. This is such a beautiful, it's, you know, forget the chocolate. We, you know, between my daughter and my wife and our employees, we really try to make it uh, a loving experience. I mean, you can, I, it sounds cliche. You absolutely feel the love when you come to our shop because of the way my wife is situated, but because we're really happy to be here. And I think you feel that I've been into so many establishments where it's like, you just feel a wave of energy that says, maybe you don't want me to purchase your, you know, whatever your, your profiteroles or whatever you're selling. And I feel like we're very welcoming and uh, people just have a great time when they're here. That's fantastic. That makes me so happy to hear that. I wish more places Derek, were like that, honestly. You're, you're going to come by. I'm going to make you a mocha. Hey, I, I love a good mocha. Funny enough, I, I was going to say this off air, but now that we're talking about it, I'll say it on air. Yeah. Um, so a, Wait, let me, you want to do all your corporate shopping with us. Let me get a, <laughs> hold on. Yes, I need some information here. I need some information. <laughs> so um, at the end of next month, um, a short film that I directed is playing at the Chinese theater oh, for the man. Golden State Film Festival. So if my wife and I are able to come out there, I was going to try to come by your shop. Wait, where are you? Where are you located? I, I live in um, Pensacola, which is in Northwest Florida. What in the world, Derek? <laughs> I thought you were in West Hollywood. This this over man <laughs> no i'm a little farther than west hollywood but uh okay. but yeah if you're coming you 100 percent are going to come by and you are going to hang out with mr and mrs truffles because we're fun oh i've i have no doubt of that so i and i and my wife loves chocolate so i don't think it'll be a real hard sell damn you know <laughs> what i uh, i'm going to tell you right now how's the weather there in florida right now is it super hot it is, it's pretty chilly now, actually. We get like two months of cold weather. So, so is it, is it below, is it below 70 degrees? Yes. Oh my, Derek, you mark my words, man. I'm going to send you a beautiful box of chocolate just because, because you're a good guy. I don't, I don't read the reviews. I think you're a wonderful guy. And so you and your wife are going to enjoy some champagne troubles on me. How about that? Oh, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Feels like a good, it feels like a game show, right? Like you just yeah, it, won. It does. You, You've you won you a box of truffles. Listen, you're not going to get the Kia Soul, but you are going to get a box of chocolate. Yeah, that's what's happening. No, I, I appreciate that. That's so kind of you. Fantastic. Now, understand, send it, I'm going to send it via Pony Express, and it might arrive as chocolate soup, but I will send it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's the thought that counts, so, yes. so I, I appreciate that. You're yeah. so welcome. So, um, yeah, as we start to wrap up here, I did want to ask you, like, do you, do you still act or are you full time running the chocolate shop? I no, I do still act. Um, like I said, I did that, uh, the show all rise on CBS, um, kind of before and during pandemic and look, the pandemic was rough on everyone, no doubt about it. And so just kind of getting my sea legs back. It's, um, it's a new year, um, I'm really excited about these podcasts, but I'm always, I'm always looking for the next great show because it's, you know, it's what I do. It's where I, I feel most at home and where I'm, I feel like, um, I can excel, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You got a project that I'm perfect for. Well, listen, talk to my agent, <laughs> let me know, if you need me to show up. 
I can bring my own wardrobe. Whatever you need, Derek. I'm your guy. I'm going to keep you in mind. I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, do you have um, any uh, plugs or like a website or social media so the viewers and listeners can follow you or your chocolate shop? Oh, you know what? Um, on Instagram, we are Beverly Hills Toy Shirt. Um, and on Facebook, we, uh, we're also we're Beverly Hills Toy Shirt. It's pretty, pretty basic. But, you know, I know uh, I, all your listeners are, um, are all over the place. But I will say for any listener of your show that comes in and mentions that they saw us together on the podcast, I'm going to give them a champagne truffle made with Dom Perignon. That's my gift to you and your, your audience. Oh, awesome. That's fantastic, sir. Happy to do it, man. Yeah, for sure. Well, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. This has been amazing. Oh, Eric, Derek, thank you so much. It was really, really fun. Really fun.